they call it dumpy and it's amazing it's my favorite thing this week on backward compatible Doc and Chris talk about Tales from the Borderlands and how it is the telltale narrative model at its best. Plus, impressions of Spheres of Influence and Nitolo. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 60 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And Jim cannot join us today. He's, uh, I believe, out of town. Um, so he'll be back with us next week, I believe. Uh, but today, Doc and I are going to be uh, doing a one-on-one chat about Tales from the Borderlands. He just finished playing it recently, and I've played it myself. Um, you might recall that I named it my personal game of the year for 2015. Uh, and so I've talked a little bit about it on the button mosh, but today we're going to dig in a little bit deeper and talk more about um, the ways that it differs from other Telltale games, uh, some of the things it does with the branching narrative that we think are really cool. And then we might talk a little bit about how Telltale's approach could be adjusted slightly to give us more branching and more options, more choice, um, without necessarily breaking their sort of de- design philosophy. Uh, but first, we're going to start with a few opening segments, and this week we're beginning with Table Talk. <music> Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I had the opportunity to play Spheres of Influence. And I gotta say, first of all, uh, as a Kickstarter game, it's a really fantastic game. Um, if, if you're looking for a gateway game from something like Risk into more um, you know, hobby games and, and heavy strategy games, this is a really good one. And it's not going to take eight hours to play. That's the wonderful thing. Not nice. I, now, I feel like I need to clarify some things, because the the idea of it being spheres of influence, and you look at the board, and there's a bunch of spheres on there, mm-hmm. you immediately go, okay, cool, those are the spheres of influence. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not. Ah. <laughs> um, that's actually just a, kind of an aesthetic design choice by the, the guys that made it. And okay. it's a really... I, I was curious about that, because I, I was looking at the board, I'd actually heard a little bit about yeah, this. Yeah. And so I figured, like, the circle's like, oh, that's really interesting. They're actually, like, circles that, like, are regions or something like that, but they're not just, like, continental regions, like, right. risk or something like that. And no, the circles are more, like, either magnifying um, the, the territories or places in the ocean where you can store your troops. And, and they, they are regions, but they're not the mechanical circles of influence, gotcha. which are in the game and the the name of the game, mm-hmm. those are what we would think of as um, continent bonuses in Risk. Okay, gotcha. so they're regions, and there's mm-hmm. more of them. There's not just seven. There's there's tons of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have three or four or five territories together, and they're all the same color, that's a sphere of influence. So the way that it works is. Each territory actually has a value, an influence value. And so if you've picked up something important, like, say, Moscow, um, it actually has a value of four. And so what's going to happen is you're going to add up all your territories. Maybe you only have four or five territories, but they're really influential. Then your score is going to be a 12 or a 14 or an 18. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you you put your little marker on – there's a chart that you put it on, and it tells you how many troops you get Mm -hmm. that turn. And it's it's not a set formula. I, I tried to figure out the formula and it okay. wasn't. Um, so it's not like divide by three like risk used to be. It's, gotcha. it's actually a little more unevenly weighted in a good way. Okay, cool. Um, and so they just give, for you, game a, they give you a table as a reference. Yeah, there's a table. Yeah, that's a good way to do and, it. And, and then there's two other tables that are really important too. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second table is that the number of spheres that you have completed and also the number of capital cities that you have completed are how you're going to win the game. But you get a bonus troop um, unit, whatever, um, if you have a completed sphere and if you have a completed or if you have a city. So it is actually really good to collect those too. But then the third thing, this is where it truly was revolutionary to me. Mm. Tracks the oil and there are oil icons on the map. Mm. So a place like Japan has almost no oil. Mm-hmm. It's it's really um, cut off and it's a nice place to hole up, mm-hmm. but you're going to have to invade Alaska in order to get oil (laughs) or you're going to have to try to go on into China and get some oil. Uh Um, And oil gives you extra turns. Hmm. 
hmm. way that's tracked is with a card. You start with two cards, hmm. you get shuffled together, and you randomly draw. So you're not going around the table. You don't know who's going to get the next ah, turn. interesting. This is the brilliance of it. Huh. Uh, now, for those who don't like the randomness of a card draw, hmm. they may not like it. Hmm. But what really is cool about it is... You can be um, doing really well and have eight or nine turns, and someone else can only have three turns, mm -hmm. and you're just wiping the floor with them because I get another turn, and mm -hmm. I get another turn, wow. and I get another turn. Mm -hmm. And you get to the point where if you stretch yourself so thin, you're like, yeah, I need to pass. Mm -hmm. And Oh, so there is an incentive to pass. There, there is, yeah. Okay. Um, but then the last icon that's on the board is what I call action cards. I don't think that's what they're actually called. But basically, you, you draw the cards, and then you can play them in a fight, or you can play them in redeployment, You can play, and they, they change the game. Mm. Um, you can uh, fundamentally change things by, by doing all the way up to a nuclear weapon, basically. Huh. And it's destroy every unit in an adjacent space. Wow. Or um, ICBMs, you know, you mm. get the bonus of this and that. Or a sniper, you get a plus one. The other thing is, whenever you fight, you're fighting a little bit differently than in Risk. It's backwards. Hmm. Um, meaning when you go in, the maximum number you can take in is five. Okay. As opposed to the other way around. And you're not rolling three and two dice. You're rolling five and five dice. Mm -hmm. But then if you're on like a land space or something like that, the defender gets bonus dice, which are fudge dice. Hmm. And in a positive fudge... Basically, what you get is an extra attack. And in a negative fudge, there's little icons for it. But mm. you get an extra defense. So it's really different because it moves so quickly. Mm. Anyway, that's Spheres of Influence. I highly recommend picking it up. It's about 50 bucks. It's worth every single penny of it. Nice. If you got in on the Kickstarter, you could have gotten it for, I think it was like 45 mm -hmm. um, But, you know... Don't don't lament that five dollar <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, investment in time to see if it's good. Mm. It's brilliant, and if you like risk, you're gonna love Spheres of Influence. Cool, I'll have to try it. Yeah. This is the Gaming Meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So, a couple of items today on the Gaming Meta. Um, the first one I want to talk about quickly is Crash Course Games, and this is being hosted by. Um, Andre Meadows, who is also known for uh, Black Nerd Comedy on YouTube. Um, so, big gamer, uh, funny guy. He's done a lot of really good stuff. Crash Course is a series that was established um, as kind of a side project of um, Hank and John Green, uh, the Vlog Brothers, who are um, responsible probably for more YouTube content than you even know, uh, at least as producers. Um, and Crash Course started off, I believe, with um, world history and biology. Um, basically, they tend to cover... Um, topics that you would sort of cover in high school or maybe early college and they do it in usually 10 to 15 minute videos where they sort of go through week by week and they have a 10 to 15 minute crash course on a subject within the broader subject that they're teaching. That sounds really cool. It is actually really cool. Um, they have some really cool um, illustrations. It's very well written, very well researched. Um, I really enjoyed listening to World History because a lot of this stuff I knew but they would sort of go into detail or put a, a spin on things as kind of highlight something that you didn't really pay too much attention to. Ah, um, that's cool. Yeah, it is really cool. So they've done all sorts of courses. They've done uh, world history, U.S. history. Uh, they've even done literature now, um, psychology, politics, and government, um, all sorts of fun stuff. And so um, especially for people who might not have taken that stuff, it can be a good head start before you take it in school or a good refresher if it's been a while. Um, so definitely highly recommend that channel. It's really cool. But what's interesting to me is now they're doing Crash Course Games, which um, they've only done one video so far at the time of recording, and it was actually pretty good. It reminded me a lot of basic game design that I took in ATEC at UTD. Uh -huh. um, they talk a little bit about, for example, the definition of what is a game. Um, and they're taking a very broad approach. It's not just video games. They're going to be talking tabletop. They're going to be talking sports even, really? which I applaud. Um so they're talking about like the history of games and the sort of philosophy of games and of game design. Um, so again, very well researched, really, very well written. Um, I definitely check, recommend checking that out, sharing it with people, especially if you kind of want to introduce them to gaming in a way that is very approachable. Um, it doesn't... Um, it, you can definitely tell there's a lot of sort of like nerd culture that's going into this, the development of it. Um, but they're doing it in a way they think will appeal to more than just your um, your typical nerd slash gamer slash whatever. Um, they even talked, for example, about um, Chris Crawford's definition of uh, what is a game. 
Um, <clears throat> and I've, I've talked to a few professors of mine who have some issues with his definitions. Um, I don't know what your position on that is, Doc, but they talk about, for example, the hierarchy of we have an activity or, you know, play activity, but then if like you're trying to solve a puzzle or solve a problem, then it's a puzzle. And then if there's opposition, then it's, you know, this thing and kind of, you I really have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to understand that when he wrote that, there was a feud going on Mm -hmm. and the feud was, we, okay, we know that games aren't stories and we know that stories aren't games, Mm -hmm. but they have to communicate. How can they communicate? Mm -hmm. And so his... His criteria was basically an attempt to get get them to sort of talk. Yeah. And and I think it was a step in the right direction for a more unified theory that we have now. Mm. So um, he's evolved since then. I think if you cite his early stuff, mm-hmm. you're going to see a lot of different things than if you cite some of the more current things that he's written. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I also think that a lot of professors have a tendency not to keep their uh, – uh, Research current, shall we say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, so I definitely recommend checking out Crash Course Games. I'm going to keep following it myself to see what they do. A lot of it for me is kind of review sort of stuff. But every now and then they'll come up with a little piece of trivia that you might not have known. Um, and it's a fun watch in the first place. It's very entertaining. So I uh, definitely re- recommend checking that out. Yeah, that's pretty fantastic. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly on the gaming meta today is EVE Online. Um, there have been reports of a new war that's breaking out, which is... this is. The reason I love EVE Online, I can't stand playing it, um, the, the good old spreadsheet simulator. Um, I've, I've tried and failed a couple times to get into the game myself, um, but from a game studies perspective, it absolutely fascinates me mm-hmm. um, because it's got so much player-generated, player-driven narrative. Effectively, well, it's an open narrative. game. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you're studying MMORPGs for data, mm-hmm. and, and there have been a number of really good studies, you find that they want to study WoW, they want to study Guild Wars, but they can't Mm -hmm. because those are private companies and all their data is guarded. Mm -hmm. Um, But with something like EVE, their data is completely open. And so we have real numbers from the very beginning, including, um, you know, who's come into the game, who's left the game, when they did, Mm -hmm. why. It's it's perfect. You just kind of have to like flying around in a a ship and not having Mm -hmm. an avatar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And in think, the traditional sense. I think they even mentioned in the first Crash Course uh, games video, uh, they, they referred to EVE as a game where people, like economists, have gone in to test their models and to um, predict uh, the value of commodities in the real world and stuff like that. Uh, so really fascinating stuff that has come out of EVE. Um, but a few years ago, there's this big war that broke out between a couple of different factions. And the way it sort of works in EVE, they have a guild-like system um, called Corporations. And you'll have different corporations of um, that have a bunch of players in them, and then you'll have corporations that form these alliances and stuff like that. And there's actually an element of trying to control different star systems and different planets for resources. Right. Um, and so you, it's actually a lot like nation building in a lot of ways. You're trying to control your territory, control your resources to produce things, to expand, to protect yourself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and everything in Eve is built, you know, from a basically what I believe is a zero sum. Um, resource uh, sort of pool where you actually have to, like even the fuel that you use to fly your ships comes from materials that you gather from planets. Um, And so there was actually uh, this giant battle that happened between thousands of ships um, and you know, some really massive ships got destroyed in the process. And no, no, this the, happens a lot, but yeah. you're saying recently there was a big one? Yeah, there's a, there's a new one that's uh, sort of breaking out now. I think they've done like one or two battles at this point. Um, but it was really interesting to me because there was actually a news story sort of thing that EVE Online's um, web presence put out um, that was kind of reporting on like which factions were teaming up with whom to go up against what um, that's cool. Yeah, it, it's it's super cool. And it's like, so meta. Yeah, it's very meta. And so, like, you know, it's almost like, you know, this is showing up in my news feed. Like, it's a it's a trending thing on Facebook that, like, a new war is breaking out in EVE Online. <laughs> and it's just as emergent as, like, a real world break or a, a, a war breaking out in the real world. So it's super fascinating in that way. Um, but these battles, especially the really big ones, they've actually um, been able to look at because of all that stuff I mentioned with the uh, the resources and the building and all that sort of stuff. Sure, yeah. There's an actual real world dollar value to the losses <laughs> that happen in this game. Oh my god. When goodness. a giant ship gets destroyed. Or, you know, even if you don't want to look at the real world value, like, you know, the end game currency, for example, mm-hmm. uh, like these millions and billions of, you know, um, credits that have been lost um, because a ship got destroyed in a battle or something like that. So it's really, really fascinating to watch. And I love the, um, you know, even if I don't love playing the game myself, um, watching the stuff that happens in it and the stories that come out of it is really. 
pretty cool. It really is. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So as I believe we've mentioned before on the podcast, Nintendo teamed up with another developer a little while back to start developing mobile apps. And um, they made it pretty clear from the get-go that they weren't just going to be making the typical game experience you know, on mobile platforms. They're not like porting Mario, for example. If you're going to see a Mario game on the mobile phone, they've said that they want to design it specifically to be a mobile experience. I think that is a very good decision. I agree. Um, but the uh, the first app that they've come up with is called Mitomo. Um, and it's been out in Japan for a little while. It just came out a few days ago in the U.S. Um, and it's a social app. It's uh, There's not a ton to it. Um, aesthetically, it will probably remind you of Tamodachi Life if you've ever played that. I don't um, have a clue what that is. <laughs> I've talked a little bit about it before on the podcast. It's uh, yeah, but I don't listen to the podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's um, it's a it's a quirky little sort of like social simulation game in a way. Um, you have your me character that's the one that looks like you. Um, hypothetically, it doesn't have to be. Um, and then a whole bunch of other characters that you have on your system, and they have these little interactions, and you kind of it's almost The Sims like. Um, except without the same kind of complexity. It's like more quirk and I don't know, it's hard to describe exactly. Okay. But, but is it is it inter- about interacting with other people? Is that the core mechanic? In Tamadachi life, it's not so much. It's more about your me's interacting with each other. In Mitomo, it is about interacting with other people. Now the way they do this is you have your avatar um, and you answer questions. And a lot of times the questions are, you know, kind of goofy or kind of weird. Sure, sure. Um, but you answer a question, and then you have other characters that will visit you or that you visit, um, and they'll answer questions, or you get to see their answers to questions. Hmm. Um, and so basically over time, you start to, like, learn little things about your friends. And so I've got maybe 15 people on my list right now. A lot of them are Facebook friends, um, people I know in real life. A few people have added me as a friend that I don't know in real life, and I've since deleted them because I just don't have any interest in learning about people mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a bunch of like lo- other little things, like you get to dress your me up in outfits and you get to like pose them for pictures and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun in that way, um, if that sort of thing appeals to you. Um, so there, uh, like I said, there's not a ton to it right now. Maybe they'll add a few things. Um, but right now it's just kind of like a quirky little goofy thing. And it's funny how weirdly addictive it can be um like at first i was kind of like oh yeah this isn't really that interesting and then you log in a couple more times <laughs> and you get into the cycle of like reading and answering questions and pretty soon it's like an hour later and it's like what have i been doing with my life for this past hour that's the way so. i felt about farmville when it first came out <laughs> I, I don't remember anything about 2007 except mm-hmm. farmville yeah <laughs> um and with the introduction of this app they've introduced um uh a Nintendo account, um, which before there was a Nintendo network ID that you could have, and you can actually sign into your Nintendo account using that. So now I've sort of like got my thing all synced up. Okay. Um, but it's kind of a, in a way, a new replacement of sorts for like Club Nintendo. Um, it was happening for a little while. Um, it's kind of like a rewards and a loyalty program tied in now with a way for you to track your purchases and all this different stuff to have everything kind of in one place. So Nintendo's modernizing <laughs> That's... in a way, which is good. Um, and, you know, in some ways they're so cutting edge and so out ahead of everything. And mm-hmm. in other ways, it's like, oh, you guys finally got with the game. Yeah. You're finally doing HD graphics. <laughs> oh, look, you finally do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so it, it's it's nice to see them adding these features and these functionalities. Uh, there are in-app purchases. Basically, you can use coins um, to either play little mini games, which usually is just like kind of almost casino style dropping a me character down the screen to see if you can like collect extra <laughs> okay. extra pieces of clothing and stuff. Um, and you purchase clothing with coins and you can buy more coins with real money, but they reward you. I found with enough kind of like daily bonuses and little bonuses for, um, doing like little missions as they call them, like read five people's answers to questions or get five likes on your answers, that sort of stuff. Do you think maybe there's a paywall you just haven't hit yet? There might be. Um, but given the way that I've been interacting with it, I don't see myself at any point feeling the need to pay any money. (laughs) So, but I don't think that's really the purpose. I think it's more a way that can be monetization, but it's a super simple app. Probably didn't take them too incredibly long to develop, and I think it's meant to just kind of get people into the world of Nintendo Mobile um, in a way that's very broad-based, very casual. They can expand their audience and potentially start setting things up for the future. Sounds almost like the loading menu for Wii. In a way. Where your Miis (laughs) just kind of hang out. Yeah. (laughs) 
Um, the courtyard. Was that, is that what it was called? The Me Courtyard? Uh, Me thing? Plaza, I think. Me it was. Plaza, yeah. that's what it was. And actually, what's. Um, what is kind of funny about it is another reason it reminds me of Tamadachi Life is that they have this computerized voice that reads all the text. Oh. Um, and so... Um, More than one or just... just oh, yeah. One? Well, you, you, it's actually funny because you can actually... Um, when you set up your character, choose, like, you know, the pitch and the speed, and you can even change the accent a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, it sounds very clearly artificial, but it's funny in that way. Like, they kind of do it in this way that's kind of goofy. And so you'll be going down to comment threads, so, like, the person reads their answer, and they say, like, oh, yeah, what I think about this is totally, and then, like, whatever they typed in. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you'll see so-and-so says, oh, that's so cool, but they're actually saying this, and their me's are kind of, like, jumping around. So it's almost like an animated Facebook in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so Boy. it's um, it's quirky. It's interesting. Thing, but uh, yeah, Mitomo, go check it out. It's kind of it's worth it's worth a look. How's that spelled? Uh, M I I T O M O. Wow. And it's available on iPhone and Android, um, or Apple devices and Android devices, I should say. Um, it's free to download, um, and at least when I got it, it was featured at the top page of the App Store. So um, it shouldn't be too incredibly hard to find. Wow. Yeah, I guess not. And now. This week's meaty topic of discussion. So I guess our main topic today is uh, at least partly inspired by the fact that I finally got around to playing Tales from the Borderlands. Finally. Um, you, you you didn't have to threaten me or anything. <laughs> uh, spring break rolled around mm-hmm. and I didn't have anything better to do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'll just play that demo. And I loved it so much, mm-hmm. the first episode, that I decided to go ahead and purchase it. Now, i got to admit, this is my preferred way to play the Tales games mm-hmm. or anything in that series because you know, I, I'd much rather have all the content. Mm-hmm. All at, at once. At once right. and not have to wait the three months. Or, I agree. You know, whatever. So I, I, don't, I don't regret having waited, mm-hmm. um, especially since I think you can just forget. Mm-hmm. There's just so much important narrative stuff that you can just forget whenever mm-hmm. you've got time between the five episodes. But um, I find it interesting because the five episodes is that classic five-act story arc, mm-hmm. you know, the, the five-act story. Um, it's, it's Shakespearean mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. Um, but there's some really good stuff about this game that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the nonlinearity. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about the final episode, some of the neat things they did with that. Um, but you, you have said that this was your favorite game. Mm-hmm. So I never actually really asked you why mm-hmm. this was your favorite game because I didn't want the spoilers. Gotcha. Um, so here we go. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert. Uh, we're going to spoil the heck out of this game. Yeah. And um, Chris, tell us what. Mm-hmm. So it, I, it, my favorite game of what Telltale's put out. Um, it's also, like I said, it was my game of the year for 2015. Yeah, your favorite game last year. Um Partially because like it was right up there with uh, Metal Gear Solid Five, but Jim picked Metal Gear Solid Five as his game of the year, mm-hmm. um, and so to be a little bit different, I went with Tales from the Borderlands. But I still absolutely loved it, um, and I think the main reasons are the ones that I've kind of stated before that it's got the Telltale game structure, which I really love. I love um, having kind of like dialogue driven sort of story mm-hmm. where I get to like choose what I say and kind of play into my character and stuff like that. Um, but also because it oozes that Borderlands style. Oh, it you know? does. Like, it's got it's got all the humor. It's got, um, you know, it actually... I, I mentioned at one point that it actually plays very significantly into the canon now. Yeah. Um, so it's not just, like, it's kind of, like, this little isolated thing with these characters that, like, you never would have heard of or cared about and never will hear or care about again. Like, it actually folds in a lot of stuff that's really important to the story. I, I would say it's like a spine mm-hmm. in, in the fact that... You had, what, three games prior to that. Mm-hmm. Are there any spinoffs or... Not, not including DLC. There were... There was, like, a mobile game, but it was kind of like this weird strategy thing from 2K China. Okay. That was, like... I, I don't even think it's canon. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. At least uh, not that I'm aware. What you've got is, you know, something that is a first-person shooter. Mm-hmm. By definition, it's not going to be story-heavy. Mm-hmm. Oh, I will mention, there were... There's a little bit of transmedia. There were some comics... Oh, um, cool. So there's a little bit of stuff like that. That makes sense, yeah. But from what I understand, a lot of those are kind of background on the original Vault Hunters from Borderlands 1. That's pretty typical for transmedia. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, well, so what I was saying is, you know, with the exception of maybe, um, you know, Bioshock and a few notables, mm-hmm. um, story has never really played a big, important part in, in Borderlands. Mm-hmm. 
or I'm, I'm sorry, in, in first person shooters. Mm-hmm. And in Borderlands, it's the same mm-hmm. um, in that you really feel like there's a rich world, but it's a backdrop. Mm. And and it's like, I'm going to go kill Skaggs mm. now. Oh, okay, now I'm going to go kill the, the shrieky things. Mm. And now I've got a big boss thing. And, yeah. and, and you get back to the point where your mission's being delivered, mm. and there's some fun character moments. Mm-hmm. But really what it comes down to is this is a world that's going to eat you, chew you up, spit you out. Yeah. Um, and that's really what it's all yeah. about. And even the the characters are set up as being very morally gray. Like yeah, you, they you are. are. You're gamers, basically. Oh, you're, yeah. you're out there to kill everything and steal the loot. Yeah. And yeah. They, they even <laughs> mentioned that in Tales from the Borderlands, which I think is hilarious. Like, they're talking about, like, oh, Vault Hunters, those guys are almost as bad as bandits. Yeah, you know? exactly. Or even sometimes, like, they, they, said, they might have said, like, worse than Worse, bandits. yeah. <laughs> like, if there's, if there's money, a Vault Hunter will swoop in and grab it. Like, you know, they, they, they sort of, like... It's an interesting foil in a way, an interesting kind of like reflection on um, what you were doing throughout Borderlands 1 and 2 in the pre-sequel. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, you know, it's funny because what where you start is, you know, the, the corporate tool mm-hmm. and then, you know, sort of the down and out underdog mm-hmm. who is... Um, well, what would we classify her as? She's not a bandit. She's a con artist. Con artist. Con artist. Yeah. Um, and those two end up together, mm-hmm. and and by the end of it, you know, they are vault hunters in the, <laughs> in the truest sense. Yeah. But the greatest thing about it is the flashback. Mm-hmm. Whenever you start, they are um, they've been captured. Mm-hmm. They're being drug along, and they're telling the story in flashback. Mm-hmm. And and their captor, who you don't know who this is, yeah. and, until basically episode five. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's like, what you know? Tell me the story, and then. They're so defeated at this point. You can tell they've lost. Mm-hmm. And you're going, um, you know, why does he even care? Mm-hmm. Why is he doing, why is he collecting parts to this yeah. dead robot? Why mm-hmm. is he doing this thing? They've already tried this. Mm-hmm. Uh, people in this world are so stupid. Yeah. Um, and uh, the two characters are very much against each other. Like, you, you sort of see, like, how they come to be friends and be partners and to work together toward this goal. Yeah. But throughout all the flashbacks, they clearly don't like each other anymore. Right. And so you're wondering kind of, like, what went wrong, what happened. They're dressed totally differently than they were, so you're wondering what's up with that. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out that there's a little bit of a time gap between kind of the end of their story and where they actually are. Yeah, there is. Um, which they do explain a little bit better what happened in the time gap by the end of episode five. Mm-hmm. Mm. And and that's cool. Um, what I really like about, I guess the style of it is when the credits roll every, in every episode, mm-hmm. I mean, in every single episode, the credits roll and I'm like, I'm only at the credits. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, it's kind of, plus they do such a great job. And I think I mentioned this at one point. Um, the, the soundtrack is great. It's fantastic. Um, and they do like, they pick kind of like a new theme song, an opening theme song for each episode, mm-hmm. which is amazing. And they have these really stylized openings um, about falling and yeah. gravity and time slow. Yeah. And they're, you know, uh, and like text is like kind of jump bouncing around in 3d. Yeah. Like, all these things are flying through the air and everything. I think, I still think my favorite one is the first episode where they're playing, um, I believe the song was uh, Busy Earning by Jungle. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have the, uh, it, it's kind of like the first time you see the surface of Pandora in this game. Yeah. And it's also the first time that you're seeing the surface of Pandora from your protagonist's perspective. That's true, yeah. So they're shooting down there. It's like, oh yeah, it's not going to be any big deal. You see like this guy who gets sniped by a bandit as mm-hmm. he's like pulling a treasure chest out of the ground. He goes and he's looking at it. And then he gets crushed by this uh, pod that's landing. Right. You know, shooting down from Hyperion's base. And, um, like, the music is playing and, like, the timing of, like, when that hits and, like, the sort of, like, the synth, like, main thing of the song comes up. Yeah, it's all choreographed. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. It's so, it's awesome. <laughs> so, That's pretty great. I and, think my favorite opening probably is the, the slow-mo fall out of the back of the, the van. I think that was episode two. Yeah, yeah that's episode two. Um, and, and the whole thing is just them, like... <laughs> They're about to get left behind, yeah. but it's this slow crunch, and you just know they're yeah. gonna. It's like gra- like someone like grabs someone's hand, and then they grab someone's foot, right? And then like the boot sort of like slips off and stuff flying yeah. off of them, and yeah and, yeah, and then and then you just know they're gonna crunch into the ground. Oh, it's gonna hurt so I, bad. I think my second favorite was probably episode four, where they take the rocket up to the base. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good one too. Um, and that one, just like the 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 tone of the song and the way that they sort of uh, the cinematography and everything, just yep. all really pretty excellent. So the writing throughout is is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to say that you know, um, in in one sense, you can write a story like a short story um, and write brilliantly, and then you can add options to it and those options may or may not be as brilliant i felt like everything i said 
um, was using that kind of old style of this is the general idea of what I want to say, mm-hmm. and but it still made the dialogue meaningful when it was actually said because it was just slightly different than what I had mm-hmm. had chosen. Right. And then the response on parts of the characters, even these insignificant NPCs we never see again, um, they're they're important too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a vendor mm-hmm. uh, or, or something, but. One of my favorite characters of all um, is the the boss. I forget his name. Oh, um, Vasquez. Yeah, Vasquez. Yeah. I love Vasquez. Now, now, who does the voice of Vasquez? I, I need to look that up. Yeah, because because he's a great I, voice I, actor. I always forget his name. It's like I, I know him for so many different roles. Yeah, he was um, in Men in Black, yeah. and he was in all these other things. But the name I can never remember. So one second. Uh, Patrick Warburton is the voice of Vasquez. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, the voice cast in general is really excellent. The uh, two leads were um, Troy Baker is Reese and Laura Bailey is Fiona. Um, so, yeah, you do have two different protagonists and you kind of go back and forth between them kind of whenever they're telling their side of the story, which is hilarious um, because they are doing flashbacks. You can kind of have someone say something and it's kind of like skewed in their favor or they make it out that they like did this really awesome thing. Yeah. Uh, and then the guy's like, that didn't really happen. And you know what? They, I, they take it back. That that actually reminds me of something that made made the choices meaningful, or at mm-hmm. least seem meaningful. Mm-hmm. You know, I talked about um, Firewatch not not too long ago about mm-hmm. how the story was pretty much mechanically exactly the same no matter what you did, and the dialogue choices that you made don't really affect anything except your perception. This is another great example of this. Um, during the deal that goes bad, it goes mm. sour, right? Yeah. You're buying time by trying to say all these things. Mm. Well, then you rewind time. You're experiencing it again from Fiona's perspective. And you're hearing all those same dialogue choices that you yourself made right. as Reese just a few moments ago. Yeah, yeah. And it feels so meaningful because it, it, it canonizes it mm. in this way that it's like, I recognize that he's saying that because I told him yep, to. yep. And it, it, it has no real mechanical mm-hmm. um, effect on anything that's happening. Mm-hmm. Nor does it affect the outcome of the story. Right. But what it what it really does is it just gives you agency in a new kind of a way by reiterating mm-hmm. the thing you said. Right. Hey, you remember when you said this thing? Mm-hmm. Remember when you did this thing? Mm-hmm. And so that that's brilliant design, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's the way that Telltale, you know, even though their stories ultimately are going to end more or less the same way every time, it's... The more you can kind of make it that, like, the little decisions do matter in some way. You know, just some affirmation, some confirmation to the player that, like, yes, we were listening, and yes, it did matter. Yeah, that's a really um, good way to say it. The, the more that happens, the better. And I think the Tales from the Borderlands, more so than a lot of the other stuff they've done, really does do that. Yeah, it does. Um, which takes me um, a little bit to what they did at the end in Episode 5, where you get to pull together a team of vault hunters. Um, so you've kind of got your core group. And then you get to bring three more people with you to right. try to go and do this main mission at the end. All right, so who'd you pick? So, um, and, and by pick, I mean who did you have as options mm-hmm. to pick and then actually pick? Because mm-hmm. if you didn't do the right thing, they're not even available. Exactly. And that was uh, before I go into who I did pick, uh-huh. um, I wanted to talk about why I loved that. It's that your decisions do matter. If someone died or if you sort of pushed them out of your life or whatever, you know, right. if they didn't like you. Um, then there's a lot of people that you could have on your side that won't be, either because they're dead or because they don't like you, whatever the case might be. Cassius is a big example yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. Because he goes from being the father figure to being the traitor mm-hmm. to either being dead or someone that you rescue anyway, mm-hmm. back again full circle to then being the father figure and redemptive. You're talking about Felix. Am I? Yeah. Cassius is... Oh, he's the guy on um, on the world that... Mm-hmm. that Cassius was the, the, Atlas, um, the Atlas guy. Scientist who, dude. You're right. You're right. Yeah, I'm talking about Felix. I'm yeah. totally... Which makes sense mm-hmm. if you if you think about the der- derivations of those names. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the two old men. Yeah. Uh, which, which is who I picked, actually. Mm-hmm. I, I decided to, to go ahead and pick the old men because mm-hmm. I saved him. I yeah. saved Felix. And yeah, I actually picked Felix as well. Did you? He, um, he doesn't actually join you, per se. No, he does he, not. He leaves behind a recording, and basically he gives you like a million dollars in cash. Cash. Yeah, like um, nine million actually, yeah, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Was. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's kind of like you're cut from the con that you guys were pulling. Uh-huh. But he was like keeping it a secret from me the whole time, and so you thought that he betrayed you, when in fact all along he was trying to help you. Right. But if you let him die, obviously you don't get to that's that right. realization. 
Um, but what that does is it unlocks um, a lot of extra money that you can use to buy the secret vault hunter. The secret vault hunter. <laughs> which, did you get to do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I ended yeah. up doing. It's Claptrap. Yeah, it's Claptrap. <laughs> which I was, I kind of saw that coming and I was actually like really giddy when I saw it. I was like, yeah. yes, they put Claptrap oh, in. Oh, he's here. your favorite character. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. You, you use his soundbite in your text messages for Pete's yeah. sake. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> Claptrap shows up and I went, oh no. And I think his line is something like, and you thought I wouldn't be in this yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, they got very um, meta with Claptrap in that way. <laughs> they, they, they definitely knew that everyone hates him. Yeah. Um, and what was funny about it, though, is that, like, actually, and it, it's, I guess, it's kind of part of, like, Claptrap's story arc, quote-unquote, mm-hmm. that, like, now he's, um... Because there's an implication that the claptrap you play as until or in uh, the pre sequel right. is actually the claptrap that's kind of your guide in Borderlands too. Oh, really? Um, Interesting. And so that claptrap is uh, to quote him, sad and lonely. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I think now that he's getting his like shot to be a vault hunter again, um, like he kind of comes across as like arrogant and like, yeah, I got this, except mm-hmm. he's totally incompetent. Yeah. <laughs> um, they paid him; he already blew the yeah, money. So <laughs> he's, he's like, I, I think you can tell it's a different writer for this particular claptrap because it's. It's still funny and it's still claptrap, but it, you could tell that there was something a little bit different oh, okay. from his normal presentation. But all that said, yeah. um, still a really funny inclusion. And uh, the fact that you know you had to make all the right choices and get all that money and then blow all that money to hire like, oh man, which fall touch is it going to be? Is it going to be like you know like the one that I played in Borderlands One? Is mm-hmm. it like who's it going to be? And it's claptrap. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, well, I knew it wasn't going to be Lilith. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I also picked um, August, and I picked uh, Athena. Oh, cool. Um, now, Athena's was a little bit odd, because the last you see her, she's getting dragged off, and there's kind of this implication that they need her for a war, so she's not dead. Yeah. Um, but they don't really explain much, and maybe they will in a season two. I don't know. Um, what happened to her between getting dragged off and then, because they show her, like, they, they go up to her, and she's working at this, like, little you know, meat stick stand. Yeah. Um, and then she's like, yeah, screw this, I'm gonna go vault hunt. Um, so there's some implications there you can kind of fill in the blanks, but oh, it's it a little bit odd. There's kind of an odd jump there. So that I, didn't, was... I didn't pick any of the women. Um, mm. Sexist. I know. <laughs> uh, well, part of it was they were, they were kind of mad at me mm. because um, I didn't I didn't do what I was supposed to to encourage the relationship. I didn't mm. do what I was supposed to uh, to uh, you know put. What was the, the the advertising that he was going to put out there? Oh, um, when Scooter dies. Scooter, yeah. Oh, you know, by the way, Scooter dies. Yeah, <laughs> Scooter dies. Um, which really surprised me. Actually, that really shocked me because yeah, Scooter's that, that a main was, character from the beginning. That was the first thing that happened in this game that really said to me, like, "Holy crap, this yeah. is canon, and it's actually impacting things." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, um, but I, I genuinely felt sorry for Scooter because, you know, I'd kind of thought of him as this sort of a dingy pervert mm-hmm. up until that point. And, yeah. You know, you go, you go over to the other side and there's that moment where you realize mm-hmm. he's got a problem mm-hmm. um, and he hasn't, he hasn't panicked mm-hmm. and you're like, wow, this is a noble moment for him. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. And, yeah. and, and it, it ends badly, but mm-hmm. well for everyone else. He saves mm-hmm. everybody yeah, and, yeah. and all that. Anyway, the point is, um. You know, afterwards, then you have the option to, to to risk the party or to not. And because of what he did to save the party, I didn't want to risk that. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't put his advertising out because right. he was dead. He didn't need it anymore. Mm-hmm. And that actually um, precluded a couple. That one decision made mm-hmm. it so I couldn't have some of the characters oh, interesting. available huh. um, because they they saw me. Th- mm-hmm. th- you know, th- there's a meta element to yeah. this. But and so um, again, we go to a tangible thing where you made a decision that maybe didn't seem like it was going to be that big a deal. Yeah, but it was. But it affected how you were able to finish the game. That's exactly right. Yeah, and so um, I, yeah, I, I picked the two old men. And then zero, mm-hmm. uh, because zero was was available to me oh, as nice. an option. I didn't so. get zero, unfortunately. I, how did you unlock him? Did it say? Um, let's see. In order to get zero, you have to tell Mordecai that Fiona is a vault hunter in episode three, and then uh, he tells other hunters that Fiona is a vault hunter, and zero catches wind of it. Huh. Interesting. So it just so happened that I had done that a little subtle thing, and yeah. and so he was available to me. Very cool. Uh, which is pretty great because whenever you're in that big mech. And um, you're performing Zero's moves, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is the greatest character ever, in, yeah. in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I, actually, it's funny because when I play the um, when I play the games, I mm-hmm. actually always play the women characters. Mm-hmm. So maybe that'll redeem me a little bit. There but, you go. <laughs> um, the just that that stealth style mm-hmm. of being able to ghost walk and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really like that. I mm-hmm. play that well, mm-hmm. and then I snipe. So uh, because I'm I've never played. Uh, 
or beaten it, I should say, with a team. Mm-hmm. Um, I just it's not fun for me. I like to lone wolf it mm-hmm. and, and really slow go through it. Mm-hmm. And I drive other people nuts. I'm so slow with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's why. To me, I thought that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But as as a character, the full character arc of Zero, I, I think he's hilarious. I think he's mm-hmm. awesome. I just, it's just not my play style. Yeah, gotcha. So who else did you pick? Uh, like I said, Athena, um, August, um, who is kind of like the thuggish guy who yeah, you're, you're kind of against most of the time. I didn't but. like his character at all. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was surprised he showed up at the end. Mm-hmm. I kept expecting him to die. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wondered at the end if I had done something wrong and been unfair to him. Mm-hmm. Because... I mean, that moment in the in the beginning where he just kills a guy in his bar and drags mm-hmm. him out, I mean, that sets the character pretty hard. Oh, yeah. No, and he, he was not a good guy. And he kind of redeems himself a little bit throughout the course of the story to the point where when I'm picking my team, I figured, okay, this guy is a good fighter. He'll be useful. And, like, I think it was at that point kind of down to him and, say, Cassius. Yeah. I'm sure Cassius could have been useful. But oh, he was great, I actually. Didn't, I didn't really have much of a reason to want to bring him. So I figured, like, you know what? I kind of like August. He's redeemed himself a bit, and I'll go ahead and bring him along. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically what I did was utility, um, except with Claptrap, which was just the mystery ball. <laughs> I, I, I kind of saw it coming, and I was actually really glad when that did happen. But, like, you know, if I had known it was Claptrap, then I might have made a different decision. That was but, pretty great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, no, overall, I, I really liked the way that it worked. The idea of actually having a boss fight mm-hmm. in that final chapter felt a little odd to me, mm-hmm. um, just in general. But, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the first fight. Mm-hmm. And and actually in chapter I guess it's chapter one where there's the big fight mm-hmm. um, it works mm-hmm. and you've got Loderbot and you have to decide how Loderbot Loderbot gonna... I, might have been my favorite character uh, Loderbot was fantastic <laughs> and in, another spoiler it turns out Loderbot is the one who was your captor throughout right? the flashback and I thought that so, was brilliant because yeah. it brings in um, themes mm-hmm. of sentience and AI mm-hmm. and all these things that would matter in this world mm-hmm. um, sort of on a, on, a, on a Star Wars kind mm-hmm. of a level. And it's interesting because in that sense Loderbot is kind of the most human or humane character in the game. Yeah. He's all about loyalty and the reason he's like upset with you at first is because he believes you betrayed Gordis which is yeah. another little robot that you um, collect. Uh, she's the, um, the sort of key to getting the vault that you're looking for. Right. Um, and so Loderbot is basically trying to get the team back together to learn the story and then to go save Gordis. Mm-hmm. Well, I got to say, I really think that Gearbox has learned its lesson uh, after the very first Borderlands where it's like, we opened a vault. Oh, and a thing tried to kill us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it's like, no, 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 there's lots of vaults, and um, <laughs> you can actually get the stretcher in them. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and actually, I think that's one of the reasons they did have the big boss fight at the end is because the end of every Borderlands game, you get to the vaults, mm-hmm. you fight the thing protecting the vault, and you go inside the vault. That's right. Um, well, except for the first one. Yeah, except for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but what comes out of the vault, though, was very important to Borderlands 2, and they set that up. They like, released the Iridium, That's right, which yeah. is kind of what gave Handsome Jack his power and made Hyperion the force that it That's is. That's true. So. We haven't talked about Handsome Jack. Let's mm-hmm. talk about Handsome Jack, the character, and the way they wrote that in. Mm-hmm. A dead character, and he's extremely important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's his consciousness in AI form. Um, and Reese, the main character who comes from Hyperion, um, has this like little you know electronic jack in his head. He's a cyborg. So he's, he's a cyborg. He, it was great. He has a uh, Cy- he has a mechanical arm. arm. Yeah, he has a cybernetic eye that lets mm-hmm, him like have like mm-hmm. a HUD and stuff like that. Um, but he can also you know hack into computers with his mind and stuff right. like that. And so at one point he, um, basically jacks into his brain and you know no pun intended jack jacks in (laughs) and so now jack is in his brain that's right um and so basically and escapes from his brain at one point he takes over the uh what was the name of the ship i forget um helios helios Helios, yeah yeah. um yeah he and so he really is the antagonist the sort of silent antagonist Mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing Mm -hmm kind of the mastermind he's kind of because he very clearly had a plan he wanted to get you up to helios he wanted you to sit down in the chair yep so you can make the transfer and then basically he's not reincarnated per se although at one point he tries to kill reese and just like sort of take over his body right yeah um with a robot mm -hmm. skeleton that he's going to somehow insert he doesn't explain how (laughs) yeah Um, all he says is it's going to kill you (laughs) pretty much um and so that's a that's a scene that you have to escape there um but yeah he takes over the space station and and um, basically, when the space station crashes, it's time when like you have the option to um, quote unquote kill Jack again, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's actually a decision that they give you: is do you want to destroy the archive, archive or not? Right. Um, but yeah, no. So they they brought him in as an AI, 
And, um, again, going back to questions of, uh, consciousness and stuff like that, sentience, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, is this Jack? Is it just a copy just of a Jack? Copy, you know, yeah. And, you know, who knows? It's so. great. Well, you know, some of the strongest moments in this game are the moral choices to me. They mm-hmm. felt meaningful again. Um, the very first Walking Dead felt, the moral choices felt meaningful. The, the sequel, not so much. We mm-hmm. talked about that in another episode. But, you know, in this one, they, they felt meaningful again. Should I tell them Jack's in my head? Mm-hmm. Should I trust Jack? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you've got great writing and design decisions in that sense. And then you've got other ones where I thought for a moment they were going to do a cheap thing and mm-hmm. then didn't. For mm-hmm. example, the trap door that has all those traps, mm-hmm. and the, the horrible buzz saws and yeah. things that, that lead down from Jack's office. Mm-hmm. And he has to climb from the detention level all the way up. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, please do not make this a thing where I have to time it mm-hmm. and press X not to die yeah. and it get reset. And I have to play this level 7 20, 30 times yeah, yeah. to get to his stupid off. No, mm-hmm. it was all just setting. Yeah. It was just, just a little mm-hmm. thing to make the mood a little more tense and yeah. be funny. Mm-hmm. And then we moved on. It also gives you a reason that Fiona and Reese had to split because right. Fiona was holding the switch. She's that actually would let him go switch, up. Yeah. And so, um, once he gets up there and like, she gets pulled away and the switch gets let go, like they're cut off from each other. Right. That's exactly right. Um, but yeah, you know, overall I think, it's difficult enough to write a really good story. It's even more difficult to write a story in sort of four dimensions, if you will, um, with the with the different branching narrative, which is really what that core mechanic is. It's mm-hmm. a branching narrative. It's right. bottlenecked. Mm-hmm. Um, but not only did they do that, but then they used some of the other nonlinear storytelling methods as well. And, and to me, that was fantastic because mm-hmm. they used flashback. Mm-hmm. Um, they used parallel story. You know, they were all the cohesive story models. Mm-hmm. But um, still... You know, they, they use these techniques overlaid on the non-cohesive, which is that branching. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was extremely entertained, not just by the actual story that I was experiencing, but by the meta. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that had not happened before. Until, not, not, since the, um, not since the original um, Walking Dead, mm-hmm. in which that little text pop-up comes and she will remember that. Yeah. You know, that was that was probably one of the most meaningful video game moments of my entire life ever. Mm-hmm. I stopped the game, reset it, went back to the beginning and made different choices because mm-hmm. of a little piece of text that said she will remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've played every one of those games differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and the time crunch that comes in, because you've got to choose, you got to read all three options, make a decision. And mm-hmm. I honestly feel like it's a really great psychology test. Yeah, no, it really is. Because cool. you have to choose quickly, mm-hmm. very quickly. Yeah. And on replays, it's kind of hard too, because you, you kind of want to make a different choice. But at the same time, you've still got that same thing mm-hmm. pushing you. Mm-hmm. And so you have to get yourself into a different head space when you're playing. Mm-hmm. And you literally have to role play so that you can play. And I think what fascinated me about that style of game when I first played in The Walking Dead is that I had just finished playing Mass Effect 2 for the first time. Mm-hmm. And what I really loved about Mass Effect 2 is being able to say what I wanted to say in response to things. I got, felt more in control oh, yeah. of my character. It was revolutionary um, for the time. And, of course, that one's not timed. Yeah. Um, and it's like one of two or three options, and there is no silent option. Right. Um, and so like that sort of makes... Telltale stuff a little bit more gamey in that sense because that is their core mechanic, whereas Mass Effect has their RPG action stuff well, to fall right. back on. But and you know, the, based on the position the, in that one, whether it's Paragon and or it's that's, not, that's exactly it's my bad. point. And I've said this before that the thing that kind of spoiled the magic for me is in my second playthrough, I figured out that top is Paragon, middle is neutral, bottom is Renegade. Yeah. And as soon as I learned that, one, there's no reason really ever to go neutral. Like, I would kind of, like, force myself to say, like, well, no, actually, I really would say this in this case. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you're thinking about, for the sake of the game, oh, I need to have the Paragon ending, so I'm going to go Paragon, 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 you know, every yeah. single time. And it takes the choice out, whereas with Just Telltale... Just hit that triangle button. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, whereas with Telltale, they... The, the choices do feel a little bit more ambiguous. Like, you know, you've got your three options plus the silent option, and you really are just thinking about, like, which one you want to say. And I think I even have noticed a few times where they randomize the order. Um, mm-hmm. I think I've noticed in The Walking Dead Season 1, like, that very first conversation in the car, I think the one that struck me is that your reaction, like, the, oh, crap, or watch out, or there's something in the road, they actually change the position of those yeah, three I think, options. I think they're all randomized, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which takes away any sort of fear of, um, one, just kind of like memorizing what you pushed every time right. as you go through to get the same results, um, but also takes away any fear that 
you know, left is going to be this sort of response, right? It's going to be this sort of response. Bottom's going to be this sort of mm-hmm. response, mm-hmm. which I find a lot more engaging and immersive from a narrative choice perspective. No, I, I completely agree with that. Um, so that begs the question then moving forward, um, we've asked this question before, but what, what do we want to see in these types of tales of games? Mm-hmm. Well, I really think, like I said, that this one took a lot of steps in the right direction, especially with the way they handled the ending. Um, even if the ending of the game was going to be basically the same, um, you had the way that it played out change in very tangible ways based on who you got to bring with you and explain like why you could or couldn't access them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I kind of want to see is more of that, you know, like even if we don't get the sort of thing where you've got, you know, four or five very distinct endings to a season, because especially if they're going to do season two, you know, they they kind of, they managed to make it work a little bit, I think, with Walking Dead season one and two. And that's really the only reference we have right now for how they do handle the second season, because everything else has only had one season. That's true, yeah. But the main thing that carried over is who survives and who is with Clem. Um... And basically what they do is by the midpoint of episode one, all of that is erased and all that matters is what's there moving forward. Yeah. That's actually not a bad way to do it, I think, because what you can do is have different endings that will affect something in season two, even if you don't let it affect it too drastically. Like you don't have even more branching in season two because of the way that season one ended. So more things like that, more kind of like your choices were remembered and there were consequences, and like who is there or what they say changes in a way that's very clearly affected by your decisions. Yeah, I'll buy that. Um, and so, kind of how they do that and when and why, you know, that's kind of up to them. But I think the more they can keep doing that, um, the more it's going to feel like it really is a branching narrative, even if it isn't truly branching. Sure. Um, and. It's interesting, too, because they show you, like, the percentages of, like, who made what decision at the end of each episode. I always um, find that so fascinating. Mm-hmm. And those, a lot of times, don't even really have that big an effect on the story. Um, but, like, you know, one that actually is interesting to me, for example, is at the end, it said, like, uh, did you ship um, Reese and <laughs> right. um, Fiona's sister? I forget her name <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> Which I love that they use the term shipped. You yeah. Know, Lance always has a good sort Thank of, Thank you like, for teaching me that term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> A little, uh, they have good self awareness of the uh, of their audience, um, but like you know whether or not like they because they didn't really establish whether they were in a relationship or not. In fact, it might not even matter because it, from all we could or from what we can tell at the very end, Fiona and Reese both get sucked into whatever right. portal opened, and so they're separated from everyone else hypothetically, and we don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, but you know whether or not they are in a relationship could be something that's slightly different at the beginning of season two. Um, things like that, things that sort of say that your decisions matter somehow. And I, I, you know, one example that I go back to with uh, The Walking Dead Mm -hmm. is, you know, whether or not, um, I forget their names, but the people that you save in episode one and then get killed, um, in episode three or four, I forget which, um, during the argument when you're, um, when you're kind of like your leader goes crazy and shoots one of them for standing up for someone else. Do you recall? Uh, no, Mm -hmm. no, I don't remember that part. Um, but I, my second time playing through that, I wanted to see if there's any way I could prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and pretty much I figured out that no matter what I said, the shot was going to happen. They were going to die and they weren't going to be in episodes four or five. If there were fewer instances like that, where, you know, yes, there was intent on their life and dramatically that's important and it makes it so that you kick out the person who did it. Um, like that still happens, but they could still survive. And even if you don't want to like have to write too much more dialogue for them, just have them there with the group, have them say a thing here and there. It doesn't even have to be much, just a line or two just to show that like, Hey, they're still around. They're still alive. Yeah. You know, fewer things where, unless it's like truly, truly important to the story. And you could argue that that death was important to the story in walking dead. Um, but I think the, the more options you can give the player, um, to say like whether someone lives or dies or whether they leave or don't leave, whatever the case might be. Oh, I know which argument you're mm-hmm. talking about. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the more control the player has over stuff like that and the more ways that the story can be different, even if the end is ultimately the same. Um, that's kind of the ideal that I think telltale ought to be working toward. And for me, um, I mean, talk about, you know, shipping characters, for example, mm-hmm. Um, the very first thing I wanted to know was whether or not you could ship Reese and Fiona. Mm-hmm. And then I was going to replay it just to do that. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I Googled it and discovered, no, you can't. Mm-hmm. And so it really kind of demotivated me from wanting to, to play again because mm-hmm. 
the I knew what the core story was. The reason to replay is for those interesting sideline things. Mm-hmm. But if those interesting sideline things are binary, not um, ch- multiple choice, mm-hmm. it kind of reduces the replay. Yeah, it's true. So, um, you know, there's a there's a character that you can ship or mm-hmm. not ship. That's it. Mm-hmm. Not there's three or four characters you can ship. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not into I'm not into yeah. you know, relationships <laughs> in games. Yeah, That's not the point. It's not a dating. Set, yeah, so. I don't I don't I don't mm-hmm. play um, the uh, the Mass Effect games to mm. see, you know, which alien butt I can, <laughs> but it's, um, if it happens mm-hmm. organically yeah. and naturally through the course of it, then that's interesting mm-hmm. to me. And I think that we're in a really weird middle phase right mm. now where the money is saying, we want to create really good content, mm-hmm. but we don't want to spend an extra six months creating so much content mm-hmm. that's not going to change the price point mm-hmm. that... Even though there would be more in there, mm-hmm. it's it's more of the same mm-hmm. from the developer standpoint, and therefore uh, doesn't change the game significantly enough. Mm-hmm. So, my question then would be: how, What's the solution to that? How do we how do we create more more content that's not just um, having the Mad Max problem mm-hmm. of more of the same, right. so it gets samey, mm-hmm. but creates options whenever in a playthrough it's still going to be linear, and you're mm-hmm. only going to experience one of those things. Mm-hmm. And I think that to an extent they already are doing it. I think they just need to do more. And an example that I'll give is actually I watched my brother play through and he made a lot of the same choices I did, but he also made some different ones. Sure, yeah. And a key one that comes to mind is he decided to trust Jack over Fiona in that sort of climactic moment. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, And what comes from that, among other things, is that um, you get this little companion character called Dumpy. He's like a little sentry turret floating robot. Oh, interesting. Um, and I didn't see that. It's it's like this really glitchy, and I didn't make this choice, but I got to see it when my brother did it. Yeah, yeah. It's like this really glitchy, weird little robot that kind of like makes this high-pitched squealing. It sounds like this. <laughs> like, it, just, it sounds like it's broken. It's okay. terrible. Um, but it's also really useful. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so they, they call it Dumpy, and it's amazing. It's my favorite thing. Um, and I didn't see Dumpy at all in my playthrough. Right. Um, but you see him pop up in like, you know, a couple particular scenes. Um, even if she's kind of like floating around, not doing anything in particular, um, you know, it's like the thing I went back to, like if you could keep someone from dying in the walking dead, you know, yeah. they're there, you know, and a dumpy eventually like I think malfunctions and dies in this very anticlimactic way that has no effect on the story. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's a dumpy. It's, you know, it, it just, well, what's the term I'm looking for? It just kind of like it craps out. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what happens at some point, but it, it's still amazing because it's like this like great little thing that they added to it. And so I think that you know adding more, it maybe it maybe really does come down to character, if nothing else, that you have different characters who will say different things in different ways at different times based on the decisions you make. So that when you go through and you play through it again you can actually have quite a different experience because the scenes are going to play out in different ways. Right, right. Well, you know, that's um, that's what some people, I would say, are, would argue that um, you know, some of the indie stuff is going for right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would actually point to um, the Undertale mm-hmm. as an example of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's impossible to play Undertale a second time without it getting meta and acknowledging that it's played it that you're playing it a second time mm-hmm. <clears throat> which was actually a deterrent from for me mm-hmm. um i you know i got what they were trying to do but yeah. once i found that out i actually my motivation dropped to zero because mm-hmm. i felt like i was being manhandled mm-hmm. felt like i was being manipulated and i'm passive resistant enough that I, <laughs> <laughs> that it, it just seemed um i don't know it seemed like they were just messing messing with me mm-hmm. um but these tales games, they don't they don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, when you do a fresh restart, it's a fresh restart. There's no um, Easter egg in there that's saying, "Oh, you're playing again, are you?" Right. Ah, right. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I say that all all to say, mm-hmm. I hope they don't go down that path. Mm-hmm. I hope they don't accidentally think that that's cool mm-hmm. and go that direction because right. that would ruin it. That would ruin a tales of game for me. Yeah. Um, but that said, uh, I think they're doing a lot of things right. Mm-hmm. I think more of that kind of a thing, mm-hmm. um, as fits the genre, and mm-hmm. that's really important. You said something really important, mm-hmm. which is that it feels like a Borderlands game. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it's a completely different type of game, mm-hmm. it feels like canon, but it also feels like the right kind of humor and the right mix and the right writing right. and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, And even the fact that they were telling their stories and they could kind of backtrack a little bit yeah. allowed for some like really funny 
you know, sometimes kind of meta moments mm-hmm. where they like said they did a thing and it turns out they didn't. Yeah. Know, they called them on their bluff or their, <laughs> their, 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 their BS. But you still got to see that awesome moment. Yeah. Because. Where they're lying about yeah. being really heroic. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they did, like, that allowed them to do some really funny stuff mm-hmm. without ruining the story. That's exactly right. Yeah. Whereas if you were to do that kind of a thing in Game of Thrones, I haven't played Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. but I would assume it would really ruin. Oh, it would yeah. just it would yeah. just completely ruin the mm-hmm. the narrative. And I think I might have said before, but I'll go ahead and say it again that Game of Thrones, the fact that it's going to end a particular way actually kind of fits Game of Thrones. Yeah. Because, you know, Martin is going to kill off all your favorite characters and everything's going to end terribly for the good guys. Well it's a tragedy. Yeah. It's it's like a Shakespearean tragedy where mm-hmm. you know at the beginning that Romeo and Juliet are gonna die, and it's not about them dying, it's about how they die. Yeah. And so and I think the Game of Thrones did a good job with that, and um I've mentioned this before, I believe, that <clears throat> where they have the epilogue thing where different characters are talking to other characters about how they remember you. About how right. this one of like the four characters you're controlling made this choice at this time. And then it kind of gives you, as a player, a personality ranking. It's basically like the Forrester family, um, by the end of the game, will be remembered as like this adjective. Yeah. Or these two adjectives or whatever. Yeah. Um, but they're, like, there are different things that you can end up with that yeah. kind of reflect the way you played the game. What's that game rated? Uh, it's rated M. Is it? Okay, yeah. oh, that doesn't surprise me a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I assume that it's got all the language and the boobies that the not TV the, show has. Not the boobies. Really? Um, and actually, the language isn't too terrible, but there is definitely gore. Huh. Um, oh, well, the gore, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. and like, you know, throats getting slit and all of that sort course, of fun yeah. stuff. So. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. So, well, what else is there to talk about with this... Uh, I, I, we kind of called this a mini round round table. Yeah. Did you have a particular moment that was your favorite? Oh, a single moment? Mm-hmm. That's really hard. Uh, you tell me yours and I'll think about it. Mm-hmm. I think if there's like one little moment that was one of my favorites, it was, um, uh, and like there's so many great ones. But there's this one, I mentioned the thing about, like, you know, you sort of make up your story about, like, how heroic or awesome you were, and then they call you out. <laughs> right, yeah. And so there's this one where Fiona, you have the choice to either um, cut her out of the deal or to, um, oh, I forget what the other option was, and it's the one I picked. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically she does, like, this really awesome thing, and then she's walking away as this explosion goes off behind her, and, like, the deal with it glasses pop yeah. out <laughs> the screen and, like, land on her face, and it's kind of like, you know, deal with it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and she, like, makes this pun about, like, yeah, because it was the option that you said, but she, like, it was kind of, like, more literal. Um, oh, blow her mind, I think it was, or that's, something it was. Yeah, and so she blows up, and so she just blew her mind, and then the glasses come down. It was, like... I just, didn't see that. Yeah, that's funny. It was, it was hilarious. So the one you probably saw was cut her out of the deal, which is like she takes the knife and just like stabs her 20 times and like she falls to pieces. And so she <laughs> no, got, it was something else. I, I chose the third one, whatever that was. Uh, so I, I, think there only, I think there are only two there. Are there? Uh, well, the other one that happened too was with Reese. And um, when you're trying to figure out how to convince um, uh, August to take your deal, mm-hmm. it's like either um, like break his heart or do something else. Right. And so like he gives like this like really awesome speech and stuff like that. So like those two options were mm-hmm. both really funny too. But um I think that sort of moment was probably my favorite like little touch. Mm-hmm. Um and that particular one where the, the glasses come down. You know that's, that's nice. That that's nice. Pretty you awesome. know, I think my favorite scene that I felt the most into the story at, at that point mm-hmm. uh actually was whenever they discover the secret atlas um, underground base, mm-hmm. the first one, mm-hmm. um, and and there's the thing where you have to dig out the dude's eye, oh, and, yeah. and and um, Reese is off in the background just discovering Jack for the first time, mm-hmm. and then and then it's all replayed from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. That moment was just beautiful for mm-hmm. me. There was stuff that, that was more fun, mm-hmm. but I really felt invested in the story at that point. Cool. Um, that's that was a moment, the moment for me. I think it was episode two mm-hmm. um, where that happened. But um, another one, you know, it's funny because the boss fight wasn't my favorite thing. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't mine either. Um, But there was a moment relating to the boss fight, which I thought was brilliant, Mm -hmm. brilliant, brilliant. And it's that you see the fight happening in the background and then it's done and over with and they've failed. Mm. And you're like, wait, why didn't I get to fight that? Mm. If I'd fought that, I would have won because I'm awesome. And and I'm I'm super gamer and I beat... I beat bosses. Yeah. This is what I do. Why would they take you all the way to that moment mm. and then have a failure that you couldn't control? And I was actually kind of mad about that mm-hmm. and a little bit irritated at that storytelling. And then what happens? They reassemble it. They get the team together mm-hmm. and they go in and they fight it. And I realize, okay, mm-hmm. I actually am going to treat this differently than I will treat any boss fight I've ever had mm-hmm. because 
I've not only seen it and it's kind of mysterious and hazy, mm-hmm. but then I've also been told it's impossible to beat. Mm-hmm. And then I was teased into thinking I wasn't going to fight it. Mm-hmm. And then I was given the opportunity to fight it. So even within the context of not really wanting a, a boss fight within mm-hmm. within a story game, uh-huh. when it did come, I was like, yes, I get to fight <laughs> this thing. Awesome. Nice. Very nice. And so it... I think it was beautifully handled. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really, I really salute them for the mm-hmm. way they did that. And speaking of that too, I think like you know probably one of the best scenes, um, if not necessarily like my favorite. In the same way that I mentioned, um, just kind of like fun to think about. But um, one of the best scenes was um, right after that boss fight where you think that um, I keep forgetting her name, but Fiona's sister um, seems to be dying from injuries. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Kind of thing. And like this really like great emotional scene. And even still with a little bit of humor, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. And then they had this great thing where um, the gift that she hadn't opened from uh, Felix throughout the entire game, you open it up and it's like a little um, timepiece that says time kills all wounds. That's right. And she's kind of like, oh, that asshole. (laughs) And then she she thinks she's dying. And then, like, you know, they're just like, no! It's like, why is she dead? And he's like, it's like, actually, I'm I'm feeling all right. And then it turns out the timepiece is actually like this healing device. Uh Um, And then that's what kind of like, you know, brings her back from the brink. And then it and drops like, her. <laughs> yeah. Why would you do, why yeah. would you decide that to but drop? Just like that whole thing, it was just like this awesome like it, it I think it sums up like when Borderlands at its best with its storytelling. Yeah. It is very serious, can be very emotional, but it's also still funny. Yeah. Um uh-huh. Uh-huh. and it it brings you up and down that roller coaster so quickly. Yep. Especially in that last scene. It really does. Did you um, look at the gift or did you not know what it was until the last moment? Uh I don't think I looked at the gift. I looked no. at it. I mm-hmm. totally peaked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it's interesting. Very nice. So, cool. All right. Well, yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, we're we're kind of geeking out a little bit here, and there's so much more that we probably could have gone into, but um, definitely worth taking a look. Um, if you think you've like maybe fallen out of love a little bit with Telltale games, uh, this is the one I think that like if you don't play any others, play I this agree. one. And you know, um, you don't have to have knowledge of Borderlands. No, you don't. You really don't. Mm-hmm. If you've played any of Borderlands and thought the world was kind of interesting, mm-hmm. maybe you're halfway through one or two or mm-hmm. something. Get this game and play it because mm-hmm. it it will teach you about that world and and maybe even make you want to get back into that yeah. first person uh, mode again. Mm-hmm. And there are a few cameos from characters, um, some bigger than others, but yeah. you don't have to have played the games to appreciate. Those. No, they they introduce those characters appropriately. Yeah, yeah. So very cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number sixty of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Doc, and we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion, because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com, and we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.